Hi, I, I'm Trevor C. Um, I actually was here last year talking about Ansible. Uh, actually, I like DevOps, but I'm a dev, so but I I have a, an affinity with dev with the DevOps community. And today I came back to talk about lambdas and how I was part of a team that built uh, lambdas with built an API using lambdas. So. Just before I go into the talk, let me talk about the talk itself. So I'm not here to just say he, he is serverless, serverless is great, serverless is the best. Uh, I'm here to talk about more about the project, what we did, how we used it, how we managed the risk of using lambdas for the first time, and what we learned, and the, just the horrible things we faced as well. Okay, so, no, that's not it. That's it. That's not gonna work. All right, so before I go on, let me talk a bit about the project. So I work for ThoughtWorks. ThoughtWorks is a software consultancy that just goes from client to client, helping them with projects. And this time we were talking, uh, we were working at NRMA. NRMA is like the National Road Assistance something something. So it basically, they have services for people who own motorcycles or cars. And so things like uh, insurance or road assistance or who knows what? And, oh damn it, this is not gonna work. All right, uh, and they had a, an app. So the app that they already had uh, was this one over here. And so you could open the app in the morning and it opened a map and you could see all the fuel stations around you with uh, the price of the, fuel state, of, the, of the fuel type that you wanted. And you could just fill up your car with whatever you wanted. And they wanted to do the same thing, but for parking. So basically you'll say, I'm just going there and just show me all the parking that is available around that spot and tell me how much is it so I can pick up what I want. Ah, damn it. Thank you. So uh, that was a project. The other thing about the project was that, that it was going to be, so when we were calling to the project, it was, it, it was like six weeks before the AGM, and the CEO wanted to present this at the AGM. So it was a bit of a, it, it was a bit of a challenge, but it was, a, it was actually a good challenge. So before I go into what we did, let me talk about serverless. Uh, so it's, I'm gonna be using a lot of AWS jargon. So if I use a term and a word that you don't, you don't know, just let me know, just put your hand up and let me know if I'm using just because people are working with Azure and Google Cloud and not, a, not everyone knows the AWS terms. It's all right, so serverless. They should have come up with a better name. So the name itself sucks. Uh, server, server means something for ops people, server means something for devs. So uh, I saw on Twitter someone came up and say, why don't we just give it a better name? So instead of calling it serverless, why don't we just call it function as a service? And that, start, that started to pick up. And so people now have switched from calling it serverless to calling it function as a service. So what is it? Before we say what, what it is, like function as a service, what it is, let's talk about the conventional model. So in the conventional model, when you run an application, you have a server. And you have to manage that server. You have to open ports, close ports, uh, install F FTP, SSH, all those stuff. And you also have to put somehow your code there, and you have to have it running all the time. It has to always be running. So that way when the request comes in, you're able to respond to that request. So how is function as a service different from that? So in function as a service, you have the cloud. In this case, the cloud is gonna be AWS, so you have a provider, and somehow you have to put your code in the cloud, and it is not running, it's off. So when the request comes in, the provider turns that thing on and you're able to re respond. The other, and then it turns it off. The other good thing about it is that in the conventional model, if you get like a thousand requests at a time, you have, uh, if you have a data center, you just buy more servers and figure out. If you're in the cloud, you just try to figure out how to scale or you just let your thing go kaput. Uh, in, in the function as a service uh, model, you, you have the cloud again, you have your code, and it's off. 
you get the first request and you turn it on, and then you get a thousand requests, and you just, it works. So that, that's really cool. That's something that is very, very useful. So how is that different from everything that's already existing? So what I've noticed is that it feels like it is the level of abstraction or the level. So if, if I'm a dev, the level of hands-on I have on the servers. So if I'm using infrastructure as a service, I'm like managing services, opening ports, closing ports, installing things. Uh, if I'm using platform as a service, something like Heroku, I say, all right, I, I want a Node.js Node thing, and I put my code there, and that somehow works. But with I have function as a service, I don't even care about the, 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 the server or whatever. I just put my code there, and I say, this is Node.js. You make it work. So it's like the abstraction that you get from infrastructure. Uh, pros and cons that I've seen, just to start with. It has the potential to be cheap. So if it's not always running, you're not paying for, for, the, for the machine all the time. You pay for it just when you use it. It is kind of like prod ready or ops ready. It, has, uh, it comes like with uh, logs and monitoring and it's scalable. And actually if you plug it another service, is, uh, uh, you have HTTPS, HTTPS by default, so that's pretty cool. Uh, you don't have to use like an SDK. Uh, you just have to comply with an API and you, you're already deploying things to the cloud. Now, what are the cons? It is, it is an immature technology. Like it was, it was uh, first released in 2014, at least for AWS Lambdas, who were the first to deploy this thing. I think, I'm not sure. Uh, but it really picked up early last year. So it is still changing. All the features, like not, there are still more features coming out every, every week. You have that latency on start on startup. So because it's off, when you turn it off, you have the, that bit of latency. And there's very few examples. So if you want a hello world, yeah, you're going to find that on Google. Uh, but try to work into something that is a bit more complicated. There's very few out there. All right, now let's go into what is Lambda about. So in Lambda, you have, you have in Amazon all these services. Let's say you have a uh, database. And so when you save a record, that the database produces an event. And the event is picked up by something. We don't care. And it calls the Lambda, and it transforms what happened into a JSON. So it calls the Lambda, and it sends a JSON or a, a, an event, and it says, this is what the event was about. So if you save the record, this is the event saying you saved the record and here's the data. So you, that's how it works in, in, in Lambda. So other characteristics, uh, it lasts for five minutes. So if you, have a, if you are thinking about using a Lambda for doing this huge batch process that has to do a lot of things, you might have to think of twice because if it takes more than five minutes, uh, that's not going to work. It's going to be shut down. So it, the, the maximum time of execution is five minutes. You can create it with uh, like a wizard, like clicking buttons, or you can actually use uh, automate the release of a Lambda. Other things is that oh, it supports Java, it supports Node, it supports C Sharp and Python. Uh, for Python and, and Node.js, because they are interpreted, you can code in line. For the other two, well, inline, or you can upload zip, file, uh, zip packages. For Java and C Sharp, you actually need to upload packages. All right, so why did we decide to go with this, and how did we make that decision? And so devs will be devs. So we want to try the new shiny thing that comes along. It actually felt quite uh, the, the possibility of something to be cheaper than usual, because you don't have it running all the time. That's a very appealing thing for people that are paying for this. So we said, all right, we have, the, we have a good case scenario. It's a low risk. Uh, we're going to try to build it. Oh, man. <laughs> we're going to try to build it uh, with, uh, with Node.js, which they already had. Uh, so it was, and we were going to try to build it in a way that if things fail, we could just move back to the conventional mode, to the conventional mode. So 
this is what we had to do, and this is why we decided that it was like the perfect scenario for us to try this in. So the app, what the app is like, you woke, you woke up in the morning, you open the app, you want to go somewhere, let's see what the parking, where the parking spaces are and how much they are. So it, the app makes a request to the back end saying, give me all the parking, parking spaces available. NRMA at this point was talking with providers of parking spaces. So our back end was going to connect to those providers, get all the information in their uh, formats, just take that back, aggregate it, transform it, and return it to the phone. So it had no state, and that is very, very uh, key. We had no state to maintain. Also, we, we didn't want to spend that much time in this, uh, in this backend because it was pretty simple, and we wanted to spend all the time making the app as, as, as usable and snappy as it could be because that's what people want. And we were sure that we were going to have problems integrating with providers because integration is just, it's just problems. Uh, so, because we don't want to, we didn't want to actually invest that much time in this. We say, all right, Lambda seemed like an easy way not to be dealing with uh, infrastructure or anything like that, or scaling, scaling or anything like that. So yeah, that's our focus. So how did, how did it look in Amazon? So what do we have to do? Uh, we have to use the API, we, have to use, we had to use that API gateway, which is basically a web server. It takes the, it, it, it takes the request, it transforms it, and sends it to the Lambda, which takes the code, the code from, a, from a bucket, from storage. So all what, that we had to do was put our code here and set up those set up that connection. Uh, yeah. So we decided to run a spike because we were dealing with something new. Uh, it, at least it was not, well, it was new to us. So we wanted to reassure the NRMA that we weren't just going crazy. Uh, we, we ran an experiment for three days. And what we wanted out of that experiment was uh, just get, get the end-to-end -end path working. Uh, just, just to prove that it, we could do it and figure out how we could deploy automatically, how we could integrate and keep this thing going in a pipeline automatically. So the first bit, by clicking buttons and putting our code in the Lambda, that was like six hours, literally. We were able to create a Lambda, uh, getting a piece of code that was connecting to one of the providers, getting that information back and sending it back to the, just, and just responding. So we have an HTTPS server, an HTTPS endpoint uh, that was connecting to one of the providers and just giving information back in six hours. So that was, well, that was very exciting. Uh, but deployment seemed kind of, kind of different, a bit more difficult. So we started, all right, so before I go into what we started investigating, let me talk about CloudFormation. CloudFormation is an AWS, is the AWS way to automate the deployment of uh, infrastructure things to the cloud. So you have a JSON, a JSON template, or a template, I don't know if it's JSON or not. Uh, you have a template, and you run it by the CloudFormation engine, which is, uh, you can you do that with an SDK, or you can do that through a command line. And CloudFormation from that template creates all the infrastructure. So that's, that was our way to automate things into the cloud. Uh, and so we, we kind of knew how to deal with, the, with cloud formation itself. Uh, but we started investigating and we found this thing, serverless framework. Uh, and it was powered by Amazon. So it was like, all right, let's try that out. Let's see how that works. Uh, serverless, so serverless, for setting up an HTTPS, an HTTPS endpoint in AWS, we just needed two files. One was one that was describing what our HTTPS endpoint was, which, and what our Lambda and infrastructure was, and the other one to say what the function actually did. So in, in this example, I'm saying, all right, I am uh, deploying in Node.js, and when you have, whenever you get a get request uh, for demo slash hi, invoke that handler file that functions say hi. 
So I have my handler.js file here and the function say hi. And what that thing did was that it created a response uh, with the message hi DevOps Melbourne and it called the AWS function back. The only thing that we did was serverless deploy and that automatically created the infrastructure, uh, creating, created the package that we needed to upload and did everything for us and just returned that endpoint saying, here, just go, oh, damn it, I have a typo. Anyway, it should have been slash, slash, uh, uh, slash hot, slash dev, slash hot. And so you get the JSON file uh, with the JSON, JSON response. And so that seemed really, really nice. What was the problem? The problem was that it was in beta version. So, well, we weren't sure, but at least when it was doing serverless deploy, it produced a CloudFormation template. So we, all, we always had a plan B. If serverless wasn't the thing that was going to be a fit for us, at least we had that CloudFormation template that was our starting point to try something else. So we decided to go with Lambdas. Everyone was like very enthusiastic about it. Everyone like had the skin in the game. Everyone was like willing to try it if things didn't work. They were just gonna, uh, we, if, like, if things didn't work, we were gonna go back to the conventional mode and try to do it from there. Uh, the other thing that we, we decided was that we were going to build things in a way that if Lambdas wasn't our option, we just take the code and put it in a conventional server. Okay. <clears throat> Whew. All right. So development deployment. We decided to tackle first was uh, we decided to tackle deployment first because that was like the risky business for us. During the during the spike, we we noticed that development was pretty much the same thing, but deployment was different. We didn't we we weren't provisioning a server. We weren't running like star commands. We weren't doing any any of that. We were just packaging something and somehow put it putting it up in the cloud and deploying some infra. This is what we had, this is what we were thinking of building. Two endpoints. One that would get all the parking spaces, and the other one that was getting the details for a specific parking spot. And so what we were going to do was having a specific lambda for each of the endpoints. But the package that we were going to build was going to be the same. That means that my all my code for all my endpoints was going to be in the same zip file. But the but it was going to be in in the same zip, zip package, but it was going to be in different files. So every lambda was connected to a different file, but the same package. The other thing that we had to do was uh, this. Actually, we get out of, you get automatically you get a CloudWatch uh, instance. I don't know if it's called instance or whatever, but you get a, like a CloudWatch entry when you can uh, see all your logs and you see you can monitor what happens with your lambda. By the way, CloudWatch, it is, uh, it's not usable. It's just, so what we did was we, we started just sending the, the logs somewhere else. Uh, actually, we use Sumo Logic, but we send the, the logs to Sumo Logic and that was, it had a better UX that worked for us. So we had to, we had to deploy this. And so serverless was taking care of all the chatting with, with CloudFormation. It was, if we had the, the infrastructure already, already deployed, it was, and we wanted it to update, uh, it was updating it for us. It, was, it, it wasn't starting from scratch. It would just up, update the things that it needed to, that had changed. So we kept going with serverless, even though it was in, in, in beta version. This, this was how simple our pipeline was. So we had some unit tests, and then serverless, deployed, that was packaging and deploying the things for us. But then we started noticing something. In local, uh, we were, everything was working great with the unit test. But when you deployed in, in the cloud, we were sometimes seeing that we had errors because we had committed errors in our coding, but we couldn't figure, like we couldn't see them all the way, well, except when we had already deployed. So we decided, so, just basically, you can't really test the integration between 
a, an AWS server and another AWS server. You can't test that. Uh, you just have to deploy it and see how it is connected. Basic, so what you have is a YAML file, and you can make a typo in that YAML file, but you're not gonna see it right away in your local development. You're just gonna see that error once you're deployed, once you have deployed. And that's a bit of a shortcut. Um, so what we decided that was that we were gonna do unit tests, we were going to deploy, we were going to run some smoke tests to make sure that what we had in the cloud was like correctly set up, and so we needed two environments. Setting up two environments was uh, trivial. It was just adding a flag to the serverless deploy command. So basically, we unit test, we send to staging, we smoke test to make sure that everything in the cloud was set up correctly, and then we deployed it to production. And we just smoked production just to make sure that everything was fine in prod as well. Local development. In local development, what you had available in local development is actually the code that is run once the Lambda is actually called. So let's just walk through how the sequence is. You get a, an HTTP request. You get in the AWS API gateway. You don't have that available locally. That API gateway uh, just triggers an event and calls your Lambda. That trigger, that is not available locally. You don't have that. The code inside the Lambda, yeah, you do have that available. That make a call to some providers, and you do have that available locally. Once you get, once we get, we got that information from the providers and part and just parse it, aggregate it, and send it back. We had to call a callback from AWS. That callback calls back the API, uh, and we didn't have that available either. That integration, it's just, just it just happens there. And, and that made the HTTP request, uh, the HTTP response. So what we had to do is that we had to put effort in simulating the, H, the API gateway, which was like a, an a, well, a web server. And that web server had to create a, the trigger and call the Lambda and, put, and inject the event in the same way that AWS had to do it. So we had to put some effort there. I've, uh, I've Googled a couple of, uh, I've Googled recently, and apparently there are libraries that take care of that now, but back then there was none, so we had to do that manually. We also had to uh, do the callback, that, so we also had to um, <coughs> simulate that callback that, make, that took that JSON and make it into an HTTP response. So, yeah, that's, a, well, when, once you have that, those things in the cloud, you have to simulate them locally, and that takes a, a little bit of effort. All right, so results and lessons. So we noticed that Lambdas was really easy to set up, but it wasn't, like, I don't think it works for every scenario. So you, if you want to do it on your projects, I would highly recommend to use, to use a to do a spy to make sure that it works for you. Uh, I think it's very useful for, for people that wanna be like really hands off with uh, infra. Probably not you guys because you're here, but I like people that don't, don't wanna do anything with, with, with uh, servers or anything like that, uh, function as a service makes that very transparent to them. So that's one scenario. Or if you wanna just do a quick experiment to see how people react to a specific service and you wanna just put it there in production, that's another way to do it. Because it's just really easy to set up and just really, really easy to get uh, rid of. One of the things that worked for us was to keep the handler, which is the, the, that piece of code that uh, communicates with that AWS interface, keep that really thin. So you get the call from AWS, that line just communicates to a different module that is just a part so all your business logic is not inside that Lambda function, but somewhere else. So you can easily take it out and put it in a conventional server, service, server if you ever need to. AWS, Lambda, and serverless changed frequently. So we started working in the second week of September, and we had to go to production in early November. During that time, serverless itself went from 0 0.8 to 9. They released 1 and Actually, it was 1.2 or 1.3. So in six weeks, it just changed. They changed every day something. 
and so did AWS Lambdas. We had to implement manually environment variables. And uh, in the, in, so we implemented manually AWS Lambdas. Uh, sorry, we implemented manually environment variables and, uh, and then like 15 days later after we released the production, they already had it available. So that happens as well. One gotcha is that we were printing out to, to, to console, to the STD out, and there was a moment where we had this uh, performance issue, and I had logs everywhere to figure out what was, pro what was the problem, everywhere. And someone just said, hey, what, why don't you just remove the logs? And it went for six seconds to 1.8. So uh, printing to the, to, the, to the console in Lambdas might be a bit, just performance, it might be tricky. Uh, the run times are not that ephemeral. So because we had this performance issue, I said, well, I don't know what that is. I'm just going to build a cache. And what we notice is that when you, you, know, you make a request, they turn out the runtime, and they don't shut it down for a bit. So if a second request uh, comes in, you have that same runtime running. So you can actually be like a like an inner cache. You just you just don't count on it because well it, they are supposed to be ephemeral. So but oh, we discovered that so well, that was useful. Results. They the cost of the solution was in tens of dollars. They wouldn't disclose the actual the actual cost of it, but they said that it was a thousand dollars less of the worst case scenario. So we saved them a lot of money. Uh, they had a TV to add at some point. The increase went up 10 times and uh, not a single error. We didn't have to do a thing, nothing. The thing is scale itself. And uh, after that, they asked us to, re to migrate the, the, fuel, the, the API for the fuel feature. And we did that because we already felt comfortable. We did that in two weeks and it saved, uh, it saved them uh, a lot of money. So that was also good. That's a lousy picture of my team. And I put it up there because I just want you to notice the ratio. Uh, the guy in the blue jersey, he's the project manager. He's not a dev. So the rest of the people there, and a guy, who so are like majority women. So I just, I was like, it's really, really cool to see the efforts of the community coming to something like this. So it's so pretty cool. Are you the one behind the camera? Yes, I am. So there's an extra woman there. Yeah, yeah. So cool. like. Really good back here. Thank you. Do you have time for questions? Questions? Yeah. So what is the average uptime of your function as a service? The what? What is the average uptime? Uh, so well, all right. So it, the average job time, I don't know. We'll work. Uh, it's like the average startup time or just the average time that it just keeps yeah, running and running? It's, it's uh, I wouldn't know, but we were pinging it like every 10 seconds just to make sure it was just up there and running. But I don't know how long it turns, it takes for it to turn, to be turned off. Yeah? How long does it take to turn on? All right, so that, that is a really good one. Uh, we had some, some, someone from Amazon talking to us during this time. And one thing that that person said is just like, don't use the JVM, not for this. So for, for <laughs> Node.js, uh, like if you have something that is facing the public, uh, it will run, like Node.js will start up in milliseconds. Java, the JVM would actually take seconds. So if you have like a batch file, So if you have like the JVM is not a good candidate for something that is facing the public, well, at least it wasn't five months ago, which apparently is ancient time in serverless land. Uh, but yeah, uh, milliseconds in Node.js. Yeah. So you put a little effort into setting up the local test environment, right? Yeah. Now, I'm looking more, more and more cloud services are available. Um, like, I know we're finding it harder and harder to, to try to simulate this thing in the local environment. Do you think it's time that, that we should start changing our paradigm? Like, I'm thinking we're, that, that's, as far as testing goes, that, that maybe we should just test the cloud. Like, um, I, I, don't, I don't know. Like, it's, it's, 
because it always feels like we've been trying to create the social world and we're going to test locally. Yeah. And we're slowly in the real life. Yeah. No, that's true. So what we had is that what we noticed is that uh, so as a developer, I want like really fast feedback. And if I ever change something and I have to deploy, that's gonna take at least seconds and that's gonna that's gonna just the, the feedback loop is gonna be longer and longer. So what we did is that we, we created this component test, which basically simulated the the event object coming into the lambda and it but in the end, at least like we were just a hundred percent just relaxed when we saw the thing running in, in the lambda. So I had my own as a dev, I had my own environment to test it. So maybe yes, but I think I feel comfortable still having something local that I can run fast. Yeah. What was the uh, maximum leverage load for the application in transactions per second after the, after the year was? So we had a couple of uh, load tests, but at some point we stopped it because we were saying, well, we're just, we're just testing that AWS is doing what they say they're doing. But uh, we had like, seven requests per minute and then we started with 100 requests per minute and 115 200 requests per minute and we went all the way up to six seven hundred requests per minute not that not like not like brutally high we, we're not twitter but uh but yeah it was like that and it, it was responding in the first the well the first one will take a bit longer then the rest will just take a bit it will be it will be like consistent the time uh it felt like when the second, when the first lambda was just getting to the point where it wouldn't respond anymore, it, it, it just scaled another one. So the subsequent request will take a bit longer. And then after that, so you can see the time uh, be, be a bit longer when they are, when they are just starting up a second environment or a third environment. But the response was just, all right. Yeah? Uh, so during your development and the delivery, Process. Do you have to deal with library dependencies and stuff? Right. So, uh, no, no. Well, Node.js when you when you install things, uh, it goes into this Node modules folder in your project. So we had to include that Node mo Node modules uh, folder as part of our zip file that we put in in the Lambda. Yeah. Yeah. So how exactly? So, the, the, the instance was not that so you know I said that uh, environment variables were implemented at that time. So basically what that meant is that I had to upload my authentication keys into the providers in code. So I, I, I wasn't going to put that in plain text. I, I encrypted them. So in, that meant that when I uploaded the code, they were encrypted in runtime. I had to decrypt them uh, and that took a bit, a bit of time. So what we did is like, all right, we're just gonna decrypt it the first time, have it in memory, and use them. So that's how I have used it. Okay. Yeah. What's, what's Amazon's like guarantee that it'll take so long to spin up? I don't know. I actually don't know. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Yeah. So, so imagine the code. We had two different folders. One folder was like AWS related code, small file with two lines calling a yet a different uh, module altogether. So, if we had to migrate out, outside of Lambdas, we would just ditch that AWS folder and take that other folder, which is just our business logic, and plug it into an an HTTP, uh, on a web, a web server. Yeah. Yeah. And one more question is, um, do you have any strategy to mitigate the uh, S3 issue? Like, if what if the S3 issue happens? What issue, sorry? S3, uh, after the S3, uh, yeah. that's the issue with the AWS S3 in the uh, US S3 unit. Uh, oh, so they have the thing called... Uh, sorry, I didn't give the question, and you So S3, is not in every region, yeah. right? So it takes some time for the the lambda in your in Australia to pick up the code from I don't know uh, Los Angeles. So they came up with this thing which is called Node.js Edge. 
which I think it lets you get the code uh, closer to the location where the lambda is running. But I haven't played with that that much. Yeah. Sorry. Sounds like a lot of your requests were fairly small payload checks. Yeah. Um, did you do anything else like target plugs? No. No, it was just that. Uh, well, that that was why we used it. it was simple get request with no stat well no no state 